for watching this video. This video is part of the professional development basic series of the audiovisual division of the American Translators Association. In this video, you will get a general overview of what video game localization is all about. I hope to show you some concrete examples and points to keep in mind when working in this field. My name is Marina Ilari, and I started my career almost 20 years ago. Uh, one of the first projects that I worked on as a translator was the localization of a hugely popular video game. And it was that very project that sparked my passion for the subject. I completed a post, uh, postgraduate degree as an expert in video game localization. And now at my company, Terra Translations, we're putting a lot of emphasis on video game localization. In fact, we now have a division of our company called Terra Localizations, which is dedicated exclusively to this area. I think it's a fascinating and entertaining area, but it also requires a lot of creativity, a lot of curiosity, and above all, a lot of attention to detail. As you will discover in this video, video game localization can be very technical, actually. So why do we talk about localization? Localization is a translation aimed at a target audience that requires adaptations. The main focus in video game localization is not necessarily to be faithful to the original, but rather to entertain the users, the players. In many instances, we have to modify or remove something that interferes with the player's experience. One of the important things we have to keep in mind in video game localization is that we are translating audiovisual content. The text that we are translating, even if we are using a cat tool and it seems out of context, can never be disassociated from what the players see and hear on screen. We have to constantly check up on this. We can't transcreate something that seems a better fit in the target culture if the person is seeing something completely different on screen. For example, we can't talk about cougars if users are seeing uh, tigers on screen, right? So the type of adaptation that needs to be carried out as part of the localization process goes far beyond the text. There are cultural elements such as adaptation of number systems, uh, measurements, time formats, colors, uh, contact details and hyperlinks. There may, may also be legal issues to consider depending on the legislation of the target market. And in many cases, other elements such as the name of the video game, the cover of the video game or the design of the characters may also be affected. So as I said, even the covers of video games can be adapted to suit the target market. And in this example, we can see the covers of Zelda Breath of the Wild. This is my favorite game of all times. Uh, the version on the left is for the North American market. As you can see, the character is in the center with its back to us, looking uh, towards the horizon that calls him to an adventure. He's also holding a sword, which gives the impression that there may, you know, he might have to fight, there might be violence. On the other hand, the European cover clearly evokes the theme of the hero resting on the weapon. So Link is a young and innocent hero who must face the world, but at the same time, rests casually on his weapon and in a much more impressionistic look. So there's quite a different message on each cover since um, they have been designed for different audiences. Here we have a drawing that illustrates very well and in a humorous way how each region or country may want to adapt the game. It is important to understand that each culture has its own interests and aspects that stand out to them. And we must take these things into account when we localize. I would also like to thank the author of this comic, Josue Pereira, who kindly let us use it for the purpose of this, this video. So thank you, Josue. So here we see on the US cover, we see blood and violence, but on the German cover, we see a clown. We don't see any blood or any aspect of war because Germany has restrictions on this. In Korea, we uh, see what may, may be a robot, uh, something futuristic, a reference to Starcraft that is so popular there. And in, in Japan, a kind of cute anime. So again, very different images for very different audiences. So translation versus localization. Why do we talk about localization when we talk about video games? 
When we talk about translation and what a good quality translation is, we generally use adjectives such as it's, it's precise, it's accurate, it's complete, nothing was omitted. But when we talk about localization, we mean a translation that is user-oriented, that often requires non-linguistic adaptations and which seeks to resonate with the target audience. What does resonate with the target audience mean? It means that we want the game to have the same effect on the culture and in the language to which it, it is localized. That is why it is sometimes said that we localize ideas, we um, localize emotions rather than words. We have to think in terms of the intention of the origin, original text. Is it something that is supposed to be funny? Is it supposed to provoke a certain emotion? So how do you go about localizing video games? Within the process, we have five stages. The first stage is the globalization, which focuses on studying the markets for the commercialization of the video game at an international level. So marketing strategies, legal aspects, and other types of, of things are considered. The second stage is the internationalization. This is when they analyze the game and see how it will be localized into different languages. So the files are prepared, the issues are taken into account, such as if there, if there are any character limits that could affect certain languages, if there are any fonts that do not support special characters. So all these possible problems are analyzed and addressed to ensure that the localization stage goes smoothly. Now, in general, the translator has no part in the preparation stage because this is carried out by, usually by the game developer or the publishers. Now, the third stage, the localization, this is the stage that concerns us, the linguists. It's where the texts are exported from the game and sent out to localize in different languages. And then they're imported back again in the game. That's when the fourth stage comes. This is the LQA. Uh, this is the localization quality assurance stage where our linguists will review all, contact, uh, all content in context and also flag any issues that need to be fixed. Now, the fifth and the last stage is the testing. In general, this stage is not done by the translator. Either it's usually done by a testing company or a higher tester who plays the game and basically identifies bugs. So possible errors or problems in the game that at this stage usually no longer have to do with linguistic things, but rather issues such as the text is cut off or the design feature is not working well, those kinds of things. So there can be many different types of trans, uh, translations that can be found in video games. And in fact, that is perhaps one of the, the biggest challenges, right? For, for the translator, the variety of texts that we have to localize. These can be separated into six main groups and each group has its own elements. The on-screen text, the on-screen art, the cinematics, the box and documents, the website and the legal content. So the on-screen text, known as in-game text, is the user interface, the UI. That is the menu, the help messages, tutorials, narratives, character dialogues, etc. Now, the main problem with this type of text is that the translator is often presented with strings of text with little to no context. So we are also faced with variables, with tags that must be respected and translated in a certain order for the sentences to make sense and be grammatically correct. The on-screen art or in-game art covers various localizable visual elements, such as, um, for example, signs, posters, maps, uh, and they could also include translatable text or they could be simple images. These images must generally be adapted with gra uh, a graphic design tool, although in most cases it, it, it's not the translator who is in charge of, of modifying the design itself. Uh, there are times, in fact, when developers do not consider it necessary to adapt these elements and they're left in the original language, although it is usually important to adapt them if they interfere with the player's experience. And then finally, the cinematics. The cinematics refers to the script for dubbing, for type, uh, subtitles, voiceovers, and songs. Now, the budget of the game dictates whether dubbing or subtitling is chosen because dubbing... Um, it's a process that is a lot more expensive. And as audiovisual translators, we know that translating text for subtitles and dubbing can be very different. 
So it's certainly something to bear in mind when we are faced with a translation of this kind. The web content uh, of the game's website um, includes, um, for example, content from the stores where the game is sold. Uh, but I, uh, here I also included the newsletters, blogs, emails for users, and all kinds of, all kinds of um, promotional material like that. So it could be audiovisual material or information about updates, patches, articles, et cetera. And the legal content is perhaps the type of translation furthest removed from the video game itself, and maybe the less attractive one for the localizer, but it is part of the what we have to translate. So legal texts can be seen in all kinds of elements related to video games, from the manual to online platforms. And the translation of legal texts is really fundamental for the user to be aware of the legal um, legal conditions uh, for the and also for the companies to be legally cover uh, for any issues in each market, right? And then finally, the box and docs, uh, which includes the manual, the game guide, uh, marketing materials or promotional material, any other um, kind of printed documents. There's actually an increasing tendency to have these documents in digital format. Um, although some fans still love to have the printed versions. There are many types of video games and there's a great variety um, and uh, criteria, maybe like elements that can be used to classify video games by genre. And um, here I will name some of the most common classifications taking into account uh, mainly the game's mechanics and the theme. So we have adventure, shooter, RPG, MMORPG, MOBA, simulations, sports, fighting, and others such as dance, music, horror, racing, etc. So let's uh, let's explore each genre in more detail. So this type of game, the adventure game, is usually played uh, individually. They have fantasy or adventure worlds and the player has to complete missions to reach the next level. Usually the game starts by telling the story of your character to show you what your mission is. And these are some of uh, examples of, of uh, games of this genre. Uh, what should be taken into account when uh, translating this type of game is in general, the dialogue could be limited compared uh, to other genres. The text to be translated does not usually present great difficulties beyond the character limit. Uh, but this type of video game can really bring out the creativity of the translator. The translator's storytelling ability is essential because in these games, it's pretty obvious if the text is badly translated or does not flow well. So it's very important to take into account the, um, the continuity also of the character names uh, the weapons, locations, any other elements from previous releases of the video game. So shooter. Uh, so this is a classic game where you have to shoot. <laughs> it is usually divided into two categories. We have vertical or horizontal. So meaning you have to shoot vertically or horizontally. Uh, you have first person shooter games that are a subcategory of shooter games uh, where the player navigates the game from a first person perspective. And classic examples of these are, are Battlefield and Call of Duty. Uh, but then there are the third person shooter games, such as the now very popular Fortnite. Now, what should be taken into account when translating um, this type of game? The menu of these games is usually more comprehensive with many configuration options. There can also be a lot of dialogue. We can find description of skills, weapons, accessories for weapons, uh, different scenarios, different game modes, uh, bonuses, achievements, uh, lots of system messages and warnings. Uh, so that's why these games often have complex terminology. Uh, there may also be historical references, as well as uh, all kinds of weapon names and terminology of uh, military nature. One of the challenges is that we have to research well and discern if the weapons are based on real models or if they are made up. <laughs> so this is going to decide whether or not we have to transcreate something. Here we can see some examples of the RPG game. So The Witcher, Mass Effect, Pillars of Eternity. Um, RPGs are role-playing games where you can represent the main character, be the hero, make decisions from part of the game's story. Um, it, is, it is a type of adventure or action game uh, where there are three elements. First, there is the mission. 
then the character that is evolving and improving uh, his or, or her skills to accomplish increasingly difficult missions. And finally, there is the acquisition of items to complete the mission. So for example, you can get weapons, shields, food, tools, etc. RPG universes can have fantasy settings as well as medieval scenarios. There is a lot of variety available. So what should you take into account when translating this type of game? This type of game usually includes a high word volume. So dialogues, narrative, descriptive content. Uh, consistency is of utmost importance because the game revolves around the plot. Sometimes the plot may even come from a previous game. So the terminology must remain uniform across all parts of the game. Uh, and it's very common to have to translate a very long list of objects for this type of game. Um, and here's where context plays a, a very big role. It's sometimes important to see the object in question in order to be able to translate it. So always ask for more visual references if you need them. Within this genre of RPG, we can also mention the massively multiplayer online genre, the MMO. These are the type of games that are played through a local network or through the internet. Uh, players use a network to interact with other players uh, who can be people from anywhere in the world. And here we see three of the most famous um, Final Fantasy, Guile Wars, and the classic example of this uh, ga uh, game genre is World of Warcraft. These types of games are ongoing. Some of them have been going on for years and years. So for the translator, it is important to know that they could be involved in the translations of the game long term. Uh, these games also have regular updates, patches, so they are constantly evolving. The multiplayer online battle arena games uh, have mechanical similarities to the MMO. But the key here is that you have a small team of characters that play the same game repeatedly in the same place and complete and compete with another team. So some popular uh, games in this genre are League of Legends, Arena of Valor, and Dota. Just like MMORPG games, if you are involved with these types of projects, it could also be long-term as they have regular updates and patches. Simulations are games where you take control of machines such as tanks, ships, planes, and learn to control them. In fact, many pilots use these kinds of simulators as part of their training. Management uh, strategy games or city games, as in the case of The Sims, also fall into this category. And also the now very popular Animal Crossing. The main challenge here is the technical nature of the terminology of some of these games. The content to be translated focuses on instructions, tutorials, help messages, um, detailed descriptions, commands, menus. So we'll have to deal with specific and specialized terminology. Sports. Well, so this general includes the games related to the various sports. Uh, the terminology for these games presents no real difficulty as long as we are familiar with the sport. We're going to have to deal with terms for tactics, moves, shots, etc. So, and the biggest and most popular sports game is FIFA, but we can see here um, a popular NFL game and an NBA game. So fighting. In fighting games, you can play on your own or you can play against someone. The classic example is Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. These games, uh, uh, in, in, in these games, really, the action is the most important aspect of the game. Sometimes we can find a narrative content about the characters, but, but really chains of uh, short dialogues between characters are more frequent. We have to be very careful when translating the moves that the player has to make and the combination of buttons that they have to press because the translation can directly affect playability. And of course, there are many other types of games such as dance, music, horror, racing, hybrids. Uh, so this list is only an example of the most common or the most um, popular ones, but it's really not exhaustive. Each type of game has its own challenges, and the kind of content that we have to translate varies significantly. So how, who translates these games? 
I call them the super translators, uh, uh, super translators. And, and I call them that because they have to have a number of specific characteristics to, to, to be able to translate video games well. First, they have to get along with um, technology because the client will require the use of a translation tool or even ask you to work on a platform. Uh, so you can't really be afraid of technology to, to work in this area. Secondly, uh, you have to be comfortable translating a variety of different texts because you might, might be translating a game manual or a dialogue or something more creative and something a lot more technical the next day. So that's important to know. Third, you have to be creative. You have to like that type of, of, of text. Fourth, you have to um, have an interest or an affinity for games. It is important to understand the games and play them or maybe play, play them at some point in your life since you need to understand the mechanics of the game and be able to see the game from the, the gamer's perspective. This is super important. Fifth, you have to be resourceful because you have to do a lot of research and ask a lot of questions. When in doubt, always ask and try to get into forums, see what is being said. Don't rely on what you already know, but really investigate more. And finally, be encouraged by challenges because each game is a world of its own. And when you finish translating a game, which you most likely become an expert in, suddenly a completely different game comes along and you have to investigate everything again, you know, dwell deep into a new world completely. So in the game, um, uh, the, the in-game text um, is usually divided into two parts. We have the script, if the video game has dialogues, and also we have the user interface that includes all the menu and on-screen texts. These texts are usually exported in large Excel files with many columns, which includes all kinds of useful information. And it is important to know how to import them correctly to our CAD tool. And the other kind of text in a video games are the uh, marketing texts. This, is, uh, this usually includes uh, both blogs and web pages, subtitles for trailers or teasers, and text from the game's online store. These files are usually more complex and can be a H HTML, can be XML, JSON file, or SRT. Uh, the more advanced CAD tools include default filters for these types of files. In the first column, we can see the string ID, which is used by developers and tells you where the segment is in the game. And then we have the context that gives us more information about where that text is used. So for example, if a character says it and which character is saying it, the source column refers to the original text to be translated. Translation is where we have to insert the translation. And sometimes there are other columns, such as if there are character limits. Now, these Excel files will usually be imported to work in a CAD tool, uh, so a computer-assisted translation tool. These are some of the mo most widely used translation tools on the market, especially um, in video game localization. I would say that of all of these, probably the most popular is MemoQ, simply because, I mean, in my experience, both as a translator and, and managing projects, it's, it's very user-friendly for this type of content. So it is very important to ask and investigate if the game is based on any work, either literary or cinematic, or even if it forms part of a video game saga. We have to be able to rely on that material to translate correctly and to maintain co coherence. So this is an example that I always like to share because um, um, one time I was translating a Harry Potter video game and we had to translate when Harry goes to Ollivander's to get his wand. Now, obviously the scene in the book um, is present and it's also present in the movie and we need to be familiar with this world. For example, Ollivander talks, uh, talks to Harry using usted in Spanish or the formal form of speech in Spanish. And this is something that was super important to maintain in the video game fans would realize if it, if it wasn't followed. Now, I'd like to take a mo moment to acknowledge some of the challenges that you might encounter when localizing video games. Perhaps 
The biggest challenge is context. So the absence of context will be a key element to take into account as we may find incomplete dialogues. So the rest of the dialogue may have been assigned to another localizer in the team or may not even have been written yet. <laughs> Um, maybe we get just part of one of the speakers, right? Sometimes the texts are not sent in sequence. So we will have to fill in the gaps to the best of our ability, usually by consulting with the client. Even if the dialogues are complete and ordered, we have to question everything, especially with regard to gender and number concordance. It is convenient to create a mental image of how the dialogue is developed and who intervenes in the scene in order to get all those concordances right. It is very important to check at all times which character is talking and who they are talking to. You have to ask yourself these questions. Is the character who is talking, are they male or female? Is the character whom they're talking, is it an, anim an animal, an, an inanimate object? Are, are they talking to just one character or more than one? So all of this needs to be clear in order to um, convey the message correctly. So another thing that we are faced with are the famous tags, which indicate some formatting with respect to the text. So for example, in this case, we see talk to PRS using the keyword skills. The tags are modifying skills and that in fact, um, this tag says font color. So we know that the modification um, is that skills will be in a different color. And in the user interface, we can actually see that skills appears in blue. We're most um, often going to find tags between these um, spiked uh, brackets, which are called angle brackets or French quotes. Everything outside these brackets usually must be translated and what's inside is usually code and must not be translated. So I've, uh, um, I've illustrated below with translated and, and do not translate. So you have to be very careful with the tags because you have to identify what you're modifying. That is what you're trying to change from the format. And when it comes to translation, make sure that it is well placed between the correct words, because otherwise, you know, any other part that has nothing to do with it will come out in blue, for example. So another thing we have to consider are variables, which as the name indicates, they vary. Sometimes it can be a number or a name that is interchanged. It is something that indicates that a term will go there. So in the example, we see that the letter N with the percentage sign is a number indicating you have a new application or two new applications, etc. The same for the name. The name there will be the name of the user. So for example, Anna sent you a ticket. So you have to be very careful with the variables, especially in Spanish, because in Spanish we have feminine and masculine, and this must be taken into account because um, for example, if we translate, hey, um, Ana, welcome, and Ana is a woman, and we say, hola, Ana, bienvenido, which is masculine form, it's something that we want to try to avoid, right, uh, to make it neutral. So if um, the user is going to inter be interchanged, we don't know their gender. Um, so in the example here, I would choose to go for Ana, te damos la bienvenida, which means we, we welcome you to make it interchangeable or suitable for any gender. So we have to be very attentive to this uh, issue in gender languages uh, with variables. Something that I, I should also mention is the fact that time is always limited when it comes to video game localization. And you have to be very efficient with the time that you have. There will be times when you have to rush to deliver in time and others where you don't have as much time as you would like to investigate the issue in depth. But it is important when we deliver to always leave everything resolved, at least with the tentative translation. So for example, if we are waiting for an answer to a question and we don't receive the answer and it's time to deliver, make that delivery with the segment resolved in the best way possible and send a note with the delivery advising that the segment was resolved in such a way and that we are, we are waiting for a response to a query. In this way, we help our um, localization teammates. In video game localization, you have to be willing to learn. In this specialization, you're going to come across heaps of resources that will serve you for many other specializations. There will always be processes, characteristics that are being optimized. So it is important to remain open to continuous learning and to stay up to date and at the forefront of the video game industry 
um, and also with technology and with localization processes. So I hope that you can put into practice everything that we have seen today. Thank you for watching and please do get in touch with me if you have any questions or if you simply would like to stay in touch, you can find me on LinkedIn and also here's my email address. Thanks again to the ATA Audiovisual Division for having me. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.